Well, aloha and good morning. Happy Aloha Friday. It is uh, another end to what has been uh, so far a pretty good week here in Hawaii with the news of the continuing downward trend of the curve or the flattening of the curve, I should say, and uh, a beautiful day here in Honolulu. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yanji Denise. Good morning, Ivan. Ivan asking, who is on today? Well, we are very lucky. We have UH President David Lassner, who is joining us in just a few minutes. This, of course, is the COVID-19 Care Conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health, both entities working to make Hawaii a better place. And we so appreciate their support as we get to use this platform with the Honolulu Star Advertiser to bring you people like President Lassner to talk about what's happening with the COVID-19. COVID-19 response here in the islands. Um, he made the announcement on Monday that classes are resuming in September, but they are going to be very different, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be talking to him a little bit more about what students can expect when they head back to the UH campuses. Uh, again, not only at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, but throughout the entire system and some of the changes that UH has had to implement in order to really adhere to that social distancing measures that we are seeing uh, all businesses and all organizations and companies have to really uh, implement into their new daily practices. So we'll talk to him about that as well as some other topics that are impacting the University of Hawaii system. And, but we always like to start off with the count and sort of give an update on where we're at with that curve flattening and the new cases here in Hawaii. Yeah, and great news, two and a half weeks of single digits, three new cases of the coronavirus for a total of 629 positive since the outbreak began. What's wonderful to see is that 90% of those who've been infected have recovered. So we have an excellent recovery rate. Um, so far, less than 2% of the 34 pe 34,000 people who have been tested have tested positive. So we love to see that. We see some questions already coming in and please start to write them in so that when uh, President Lassner joins us, uh, we can get right to it. And this is a question about athletics uh, and there's and if certain facilities are gonna be open and there's a lot of questions about that. How do sports proceed in a COVID-19 uh, world? That's right, so we want to, act, and a big announcement actually coming yesterday from the Monroe campus, we'll get to that as well. But first up, we wanna welcome in UH President David Lassner to the conversation. Thank you so much, David, for joining us and for being here. First up, if you can cut, sort of give a recap of the announcement that was made earlier this week and some of the changes that are going to be happening to the University of Hawaii system when you welcome back in students. Sure. So what we announced um, uh, this week was that we are resuming in-person classes uh, for fall, but it will be highly modified so that we can protect the safety of our students and employees. So by highly modified, what I mean is we will be implementing social distancing practices in our classrooms, in our labs, in our libraries, in our study spaces. Um, we'll be following whatever guidance is provided to us by public health officials, the uh, state, and the counties in which we have campuses. Um, we will also be preparing as we do that uh, for the possibility of another outbreak in the fall. So what we learned this spring is that our faculty and students were just amazing in adapting with almost no notice, notice to go fully online uh, right after spring break and for the rest of the semester. Um, but it wasn't planned uh, until the last three weeks or so before we went online. So we'll be using the summer to actually prepare our campuses, our faculty, our students for the possibility that there's an outbreak on one or more islands that causes us to have to um, revert to fully online during the fall semester. And talking about what's happened so far, do you feel like students have been able to keep up with their studies? I know, especially at the, you know, when we when we talked to Dr. Kishimoto, looking at the Hawaii public school systems, there's a real question about access to resources. Do students have enough resources at the university level to continue to participate? So um, we have maintained access to resources. You know, the biggest problem, as I understand it, with some of the DOE students was really access to computers and broadband at home. Um, more of our students um, had such access. We also kept labs open on all of our campuses so that those students who did not have access to could come in typically to a library, to a computer lab, uh, again, in a fully socially distanced manner so that we could help them complete their uh, semester on time. Our advisors were available online, our faculty were teaching online, our support services were available online. So it was a pivot, not just for the classroom experience, but really for um, 
for everyone on our campuses. Within our dorms, uh, most of our student residents uh, left uh, either to the mainland or to their homes on Oahu or on the neighbor islands. Uh, but we did uh, keep some students wanted to live uh, they had nowhere safer to go. So they could have been an international student who couldn't get home or who might not have been as safe in their country as they are here in Hawaii. Um, and for them, we continued to serve meals. Uh, they were to go or um, other forms of not being able to sit down restaurant style as they normally would in a student residence hall. Um, so all of those adaptations were made on the fly and we'll be prepared to make them again if we have to in the fall, but we're sure hoping not to. What does that, what does dormitory life look like in the fall for in this situation? Because you're going to have to implement these social distancing measures, but right. uh, there's going to be people that have to live together in a dormitory. And some of those rooms are pretty small. How does that work? And, and how are you guys managing through some of those? So measures? we're working through how we'll do that um, now. Fortunately, we have about three months to prepare for our uh, August 24th start of instruction. Uh, we know we will have many fewer students. So that gives us a lot of options to um, um, space them out uh, quite a bit better than, than we would in normal times. What are you thinking about enrollment in the fall? Are you expecting more students because there could be a number of students who used to go to school on the mainland who now want to join the UH system? Or are you thinking fewer students because of the concerns about COVID? It's um, almost impossible to predict. So we're preparing for all of those eventualities. Um, I think you hit the key factors though already. Um, we do think that there will be a lot of interest from local students in um, staying home and their families, uh, both because of the safety factor and wanting to be near family in case something goes wrong, um, and also cost. Uh, particularly what we're hearing from a lot of students is why do I wanna pay to go to an expensive mainland university especially if all I'm going to have is an online experience. Um, so some of those students are thinking of staying home as well. Um, I, I'd also like to say, um, you know, for, for those in our community, both the high school class of 2020, which those who graduate, you know, will be amazing students to have made it through this school year out of our public high schools is a real testimonial to their strength uh, and perseverance. It has been hard for them. We will welcome all of them. And frankly, to the extent many public high school students go straight from school into the job market, there won't be much of a job market for them um, starting this summer uh, here in Hawaii. And the opportunity to go straight into higher education to better themselves. Um, we know that people with a college degree, um, they, um, they make more money. A bachelor's degree is worth on average a million dollars in lifetime earnings over a high school graduate. Uh, they are healthier, they live longer, they're less likely to become unemployed, they're more likely to get their jobs back quickly after a recession. For society at large, they draw on less social services, less likely to become incarcerated, they're healthier, uh, they vote more, they volunteer more, their kids are more likely to go to college. Um, it's a great investment, and especially when you can't get a job, that's the a perfect time to make the choice to go to college, even if you weren't thinking about it. Um, our campuses are affordable, they will be safe, and there's opportunity on every island. Um, we're also uh, looking to those who have become unemployed, who may be thinking about this being the opportunity for a career change. And many of those who have become unemployed are in um, low wage jobs, and maybe they would like to um, change professions. And uh, the University of Hawaii and our campuses offer them that opportunity as well. I want to get back to maybe again the logistical side because we see some questions about social distancing. I'm thinking about like my time at UH and, and some of those lecture halls are very big with uh, you know a lot of people, a lot of chairs that are all tight. I mean, how do you manage some of those larger lecture halls, especially at UH Manoa? So um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we uh, we have the option we think of using in a large lecture hall. If you can remember that far back, Ryan. <laughs> um, <laughs> We could probably use every third seat, for example, and mm -hmm. achieve safe social distancing. But um, more likely, really, what we're going to do is leverage the skills that we developed over this spring. And we learned a lot this spring in the forced transition to online. But um, we could give a lecture online 
as effectively and in some cases more effectively than in a large lecture hall and then uh, have the interactive portion maybe in smaller groups in socially distanced spacing where students could come in for discussions, but also to some of that discussion online as well. I think our faculty and students really learned a lot about what online environments are good for and you know where we need a little more personal touch and uh, we can blend those together in hybrid and um, there's a new term going around now, high flex environment where students may be in a classroom, they may be at home, and they might shift between those two modes uh, during the course of a semester, even in a given class. I would also think that given how nice our weather is for so much of the year, are you anticipating holding some of those discussions outside? Exactly, exactly, that's right. So fresh air, um, fresh air is good and you can socially distance very easily. Yeah. I, want to, I want to bring in a question from Keone. He's asking about just the overall operations side, the campus operations, money-wise, and um, un, uh, employment opportunities, and just the overall UH budget, I guess, looking at it, uh, with a lot dependent on maybe the state as well as tuition. If those numbers are down, how is that going to impact the um, operations uh, of the system as a whole? So um, what we're looking at um, is, frankly, scenario planning. We don't have facts. So we don't know what our state, our operating budget is primarily um, our state general fund appropriations. And as you know, the legislature is going back into session next week. They'll be making some decisions about that. Uh, the other half of our general uh, operating budget is the tuition we receive. And um, you know, your question about enrollment was astute. Not only do we not know the numbers, but we don't know the mix. And the non-resident students actually pay us um, a higher tuition rate and we th so the more non-resident students we have generally the more revenue we have to support our resident students who tend to be supported by the general funds so we're planning for multiple scenarios um, we're going to have to make some hard choices we know it won't be um, the numbers will be down you know the general fund appropriations will certainly be down um, we do not at this time have plans for reductions in employment specifically, but um, our conversations within the leadership are how do we focus on the things that Hawaii needs the most from us. Um, and so um, it, it will be difficult. We know that. Um, the other unknown is, as you know, was widely publicized, the governor uh, proposed some uh, salary reductions. That would have been one way to adapt to lower general fund appropriations. Um, there are other ways to make those adapt adaptations. And I know the legislators are trying to find ways to um, uh, make this as, uh, uh, cause as little pain as possible, both to the services that we provide, as well as the rest of the state government, but also as little pain as possible to public employees. Thinking about those non-residents, uh, you know, non-Hawaii residents that could be coming, they will probably have to do some kind of a quarantine. Have you thought about what that actually is going to look like? And will you then stay open for all breaks so that they don't have to go and come back? I mean, how, how does that work? So, um, yeah, we've started planning that this week. Um, really what we announced uh, on Monday was we put our stake in the ground as to the planning that we need to do over these three and a half months. But we wanted to provide some certainty certainty to our students and faculty as to what they could accept uh, expect. So um, we are actually leveraging the capabilities that we have within the University of Hawaii. Um, we have a medical school, we have a nursing school, we have a school of social work and public health. And so we have the capacity to do testing, contact tracing. Uh, we have rooms in our residence halls that can be used for isolation. Uh, when we didn't know what to expect for spring break. As you well know, um, our state has plenty of empty hotel rooms right now. Sad for the hospitality industry, but um, we had um, kind of a handshake partnership with a hotel. So if we had to isolate students, we were ready to utilize rooms in a hotel to do that with private bathrooms. So um, all of this can come together. Uh, my dream scenario would be that if a student arrives from somewhere else, we could quickly test them. And if they test negative, they could come right into the flow because that's the purpose of the quarantine is really um, to ensure that nobody comes in with the virus and spreads it. But there are other ways of preventing that as well. And we think 
we may have enough control of our campus environments to be able to do some of those things. So we are very hopeful that we'll be able to work with public health officials to find a way so that um, every student com coming in from somewhere else does not necessarily have to go through 14 day quarantine. And of course, if they test positive, then that's exactly what we need them to do to keep them safe and those around them safe. And we'll be able to keep an eye on them so that if they develop symptoms, um, we will be able to ensure that they um, get access to the healthcare that they need. Will you folks be expanding, you know, the healthcare on campus, uh, you know, because there are the healthcare clinics uh, there where people can go in if they're feeling sick, uh, like on UH Manoa, there's that facilities. Is there's right. any effort being taken there uh, to maybe be an area for testing and things like that if students want to get tested? So in general, we rely on the healthcare available that our students have coming in. So um, we are not the primary source of healthcare for most of our students. Um, but as I said, we do have resources available should we need to surge up. And um, the deans of all of our healthcare programs are, um, are now involved in our planning and that will be part of ensuring that we have that safety net available as well as our, um, student, our uh, university health center, the, the uh, service that you mentioned on the UH Manoa campus. Outside of students, so many people in Hawaii are invested in UH when it comes to athletics. What are you thinking when it comes to athletics? Because there are so many issues. First of all, can contact sports continue? And how do we engage other teams outside of the islands if we have these quarantine restrictions? Is it reasonable for our athletes to, to travel? What, what are you looking at when it comes to athletics? That one is still an open book, Yinji. Um yeah, um, one of the aspects of this one is that it's a decision that we can't make unilaterally. So every contest requires at least two teams. Um, so I'm on the boards of both the Big West Conference and the Mountain West Conference. We play football in the Mountain West and most other sports in the Big West. And um, college and university presidents around the country are grappling with this, as are the conferences and as is the NCAA. So the NCA released this week some guidelines on how they think uh, intercollegiate athletics could safely resume. Um, I think the scenarios include, um, in, you know, beginning, well, everything from no sports to sports without fans to sports with fans in a socially distanced manner. But, you know, the guidelines from every governor are different as well. So thinking about what the governor of California um, allows his schools to do versus what our governor allows us to do. And then in the Mountain West, we, you know, you throw in another six or seven states and it's a pretty complex framework um, to work through. So um, that's a work in progress that we're, you know, in discussions. And uh, I talk with athletics director Matlin as often as any of our deans and directors and campus heads. You know, yesterday we heard a big announcement coming from the Manoa campus about the athletes and the extension of that eligibility for uh, some of those athletes who had their seasons cut short. Uh, in that clause, though, it says that, you know, it's not necessarily going to take more money out of the scholarships that the teams would be responsible for actually, uh, essentially funding each of these right. scholarships to, to remain longer. What does that mean? And how does that look like? Each team will have to basically cover the cost of each of those student athletes that would like to return. Yeah, so in some cases, they may forego a incoming scholarship. In some cases, they may be um, fundraising for those. A lot of the spring sports also, um, the scholarships are only partial, right? Mm -hmm. So in, 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 you know, basketball, most of our student athletes are getting a full scholarship. That's not true in sports like volleyball, softball, uh, some of those others. So, um, I, I mean, I've been pretty clear with everybody on campus. We have a freeze in place. This is not the time to be creating new expenses for the university. We need to be finding ways to reduce expenses. But on the other hand, you know, the passion of the state, you know, especially for men's volleyball, you know, presumably tomorrow we would have been playing in the national championship. So um, that's an opportunity that we lost this year. And um, the community support for some of these teams is just unbelievable. The excitement around Coach Graham and what you know, we had expected him to do um, the opportunity for some of our best volleyball players uh, to come back and win that elusive national championship. Um, we, we would like to preserve that opportunity um, if we can. But that said, you know, all of this is predicated on, yeah. again, decisions by our conferences in the NCAA as to what's possible.
yeah, let's just hope that things are sort of implemented in place so that there is a season for them to participate exactly. in when that comes around. Exactly. Uh, you know, this, the spring is likely to be better than the fall, you know, to be honest. I think we all know that. Um, but um, everything I read suggests that um, the coronavirus, this coronavirus is not going to be gone by spring. You know, we won't be fully safe until um, there is a vaccine and there's um, solid treatment. Okay. Well, we thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your Friday to spend uh, sort of updating uh, us uh, on the efforts that the University of Hawaii is taking. And uh, as this sort of moves on, we'd love to have you back maybe in a yep. few weeks to get an update. To okay. See what's you know happening. where to find me. And for all your viewers, <laughs> thank you. And apply.hawaii.edu. There you go. That was my next question. <laughs> what, what is the time frame for applications? You know, people might, like, as you said, they may uh, have lost their jobs and they're starting yep. to think, okay, what am I going to do for the next, you know, year or so, or, you know, what's and, next and for me? For that reason, we actually extended our application deadlines beyond um, our normal. And so we're accepting applications for admission through um, August 1st. All right. Okay. So apply.hawaii.edu. Pretty easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Aloha. Thank Aloha. you. Very interesting to hear. And that athletics question that I know so many people are invested in, and just really, it's it's so hard to tell. And, and, and him bringing in the point that it really depends not only on the university presidents, but really on the governors of every state. So that's a really, that's a complex puzzle there. Yeah, and, and even just the, the social distancing aspect of that, if teams are allowed to participate, and then uh, what about the fans? Are they gonna be allowed to be in these stadiums? Will there be social distancing there? We also hope to at some point talk to uh, UH Athletic Director Dave Matlin uh, to sort of get an update, I think when things get a little bit more clear from their end, I, I know that there's still a lot of question marks, but going back uh, to the other side of that and him talking, uh, President Lasser talking about just the classroom configurations, how they're gonna manage that and, and really try to help facilitate some of those teacher, professor, and student, uh, you know, teaching mechanisms are, are going to look a lot different, including potentially uh, classes outdoors. So mm -hmm. we'll see what those things look like. Yeah. And enrollment too, that's a big question mark. Do we, do they get a surge of people coming in because they don't want to go back to the mainland or will a lot of people decide to forego university for a while and do something else? So very interesting. And, 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 and he has a good point, you know, maybe it is a time to pursue a degree. So it was apply.hawaii.com. EDU, EDU, right? That's okay. right. Uh, and him talking about students coming into, uh, you know, to Hawaii in a 14-day quarantine and sort of transitioning that into other news. Uh, you know, one of the new requirements uh, will be for passengers that are arriving in Hawaii with that new implemented 14-day quarantine. They're actually going to revise that agriculture form that they were using for arriving guests and visitors to Hawaii to fill out. They're actually modifying that. Now, everyone has to fill out a form. You know, in the past, you could also, it was basically one form per household, but now they're being uh, much more deliberate about tracking each individual. So each person will need to fill that out. They're being much more detail oriented. So that new form also taking into effect. They're also gonna expect delays because of the added screening that will happen for incoming passengers. They said, normally they try to get passengers that arrive out of, ten, uh, out of the airport in 10 minutes. This could potentially be half an hour or more with some of these new implemented procedures that are being put in place. So. A lot of that will be uh, still fine-tuned, and I, I'm sure we'll see some adjustments that will be made, but also uh, just uh, communicating that to visiting uh, passengers that are coming into Hawaii, knowing that this is not something that it's going to be easy. It's going to take some time for you to get cleared to get out of the airport. Yeah, I think they want to do a much better job of tracking who is coming in. The other thing that they're adding, um, at least for the time being, is that you'll have to fill out that form if you're inner island as well. That'll go away, obviously, once they lift those restrictions. But that's something that we haven't seen before. So they want to keep a much better track of where everybody is going. Um, something else that was announced yesterday that was unexpected was Mayor Kirk Caldwell announced a $25 million program that is funded through the CARES Act, which is federal money um, to help people who are in need of up to, I believe it's $1,000. Yes, here I have the numbers here, $1,000 per month for eligible household expenses, up to $500 a month for childcare expenses. Um, families of four who make more than $90,000 can qualify for, the reimbur for these reimbursements. You've got to, of course, demonstrate financial need. And you can find all the information on how to apply at oneoahu.org. So Mayor Kurt Caldwell announcing that for Oahu residents yesterday. Yeah, they're being very specific and clear that you have to show proof and evidence that uh, of the impact 
that this pandemic has had on your occupation, on your overall budget uh, as a family and a household. So uh, there is some you know, qualifications that go into that process, but something that we'll also keep a track on to see how many people are applying for that. We hope to have the mayor back on here next week. We'll continue to keep you posted on that uh, so we can get more information about this program for those because we know that a lot of parents will be looking for support in that area. Uh, also happening next week, the lawmakers will be returning to sort of a condensed legislative session, uh, sort of like a compressed six to 10 day session to advance some of the proposals to help with that $1.5 billion shortfall that the state is expecting in their budget. And so lawmakers are gonna be looking at all alternatives. There was an uh, a, a idea floated around yesterday by Senator Thielen to actually use the CARES money that is coming in to send that $600 from that uh, from that finance and that, that part, part of the um, money that's coming in directly to those unemployment people that are still waiting. And essentially the unemployed workers would then have to reimburse the state. So advancing the money beforehand because of that backlog that they're seeing in the unemployment benefits. So ideas like that uh, are gonna be things that have to be discussed during this condensed session as they look for ways to sort of fill the gap. Again, they're gaveling in on Monday to sort of try to fix the state budget and find ways where the state can sort of recoup and, and try to make adjustments where need be. Yeah, and very interesting because, you know, they 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 were excused, you know, all, obviously all of a sudden a lot of bills had crossed over. What happens to legislation that had made it through and then now what happens because that money is gone? So we have to see how lawmakers are going to figure out what bills continue on and, you know, just on a logistical standpoint, how they handle all that backlog. Yeah, I think it basically starts like a special session. Uh, there's no way that the legislature is going to be able to go through that entire process of crossovers and then conferencing and try to get all that. It basically is going to be a majority package sort of deal that they're currently working on now and sort of listing out what they're doing, having some conferencing on it. And uh, that's the only way that you make a three month session into a week. And so there's <laughs> going to be a lot of things, though, that are going to be left off the table. And I know a lot of projects and a lot of people and nonprofits and CIP money that are just not going to be available. But a lot of people will also be down there lobbying to so show why they uh, deserve funding, especially on those shovel ready projects, which are part of sort of this recovery effort, as we've heard our leaders talk about before. Yeah. And we're lucky enough that we will have Governor Ige on on Monday. So we'll be asking him all about that, about the process and what will make it through and what perhaps won't. Of course, we'd like to highlight a Hawaii hero every day. Um, we got to give a special shout out because Mother's Day is coming up. So moms are the heroes, definitely. But uh, in addition to that, we uh, want to tell you about the Food for Hawaii's Ohana distribution event that's happening right now at Leeward Community College. Um, that's the map right there. Uh, they're allowing two to three households per vehicle. That's to help minimize traffic. But they are warning folks that you need to gas up if you head down there because they're be prepared to wait three to four hours. Um, it's a long wait for a lot of resources, up to 50 pounds of food that includes produce, eggs, milk, bread. I mean, we saw just the, the wonderful resources that are being given out to families in need there. Um, humbling to see all of those people in need, thousands of people lining up. They are, I believe, giving out 4,000 uh, packets, if I'm not mistaken. It's the Hawaii Community Foundation, Bank of Hawaii, the City and County of Honolulu, and of course, Hawaii Food Bank. So they're going to be doing more distributions like this. If you happen to miss today's distribution, um, we will let you know, well, and there will be another one. And also you can always go to hawaiifoodbank.org. That's right, I'm expecting again, a lot of people, uh, it actually opened at 10 o'clock, so we'll see uh, how those lines look uh, out there on the leeward side. Also happening today, uh, one Hawaii is continuing on with their mass distribution. We're seeing uh, a large number of people, of course, going to these drives. This one coming specifically to Mo'ili'ili and the Manoa area. So for those people who are looking for masks and looking for ways, again, it's mandatory here in the city and county of Honolulu to wear these masks when you're out, especially in those essential businesses. And so uh, they're providing an opportunity for people to have access to these masks who may not have enough. Uh, again, recommendation is to have potentially four, three to four of these masks uh, where you can rotate through and watch. And so they're going to be handing out masks that will be there. I will actually be there with a few people uh, partnering with the Peely Group at the Bye Bye Collection. So I uh, encourage you, if you're looking for a mask, head on down there. We will be there from four to six this afternoon uh, handing out masks with One Hawaii.
Yeah, and if you see Ryan, make sure you give him a nice big shaka. Tell him that you said yeah. hi. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate uh, everyone. Hawaii has been doing just such a tremendous job of making sure that everyone in Hawaii does, in fact, have a mask. So, reminder, of course, you know it is Mother's Day. If you can't see your mother in person because you know we've been told that we still need to maintain our social distance, give mom a call and uh, wear your mask. Stay safe, everyone. We know that. Um, you know, these numbers are looking good. We've seen these single digits for two and a half weeks, so it's easy to get complacent, but we really need to stick it through. Now is the time more than ever to continue to abide by the restrictions so that these can be lifted uh, as fast as possible. That's right. And again, make sure you tune in next week. Uh, as Yanji said, we will be joined by Governor David Ige on Monday. Scott Murakami will also be joining us on Tuesday again to talk about some of the updates and changes that they've made uh, they seem to be making changes every day to the system. We'll talk a little bit more to him on Tuesday about some of those filing and qualification processes. And then we'll also be talking to a doctor back here from Hawaii Pacific Health on Wednesday, as well as uh, Dr. Christina Kishimoto, uh, the superintendent, will be back here as well next week. So another full week of uh, lineup. We want to hear from you about the guests that you want to hear from, some of the people that uh, you know maybe you have an opportunity to ask your questions to. We want to be able to provide you the access to them and answer as many questions as we possibly can. Again, we want to thank our sponsors, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health for making this possible. Yanji, happy early Mother's Day to you <laughs> and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there uh, who put up with us crazy children at times. <laughs> Aloha, everyone. Have a great weekend. Aloha. We'll see you next week.